The German government has presented a civil defense risk analysis report to the Bundestag, drawing on lessons from Russia's war against Ukraine. The report envisions a scenario of potential conflict between an unnamed aggressor and NATO, highlighting the fusion of classical and unconventional warfare, including cyber attacks and disinformation campaigns. The proposed scenario unfolds in four phases, hybrid influence, deployment of forces, open military aggression, and a breakthrough into Germany. The report suggests using this scenario as the foundation for a civil defense concept, emphasizing the need for effective defense strategies. Additionally, the Bundeswehr is developing a new operational defense plan in response to perceived Russian aggression, expected to be classified as top secret and completed by March. German Defense Minister Boris Pistorius has cautioned NATO to prepare for a possible Russian attack on a NATO country within five to eight years. The breakaway Transnistria region of Moldova has appealed to Russia for assistance against what it perceives as economic pressure from Moldova. This appeal follows Moldova's requirement for Transnistrian firms to pay import duties to the central budget. Transnistria, an unrecognized statelet supported by Moscow, held a congress seeking diplomatic measures from Russia to protect itself. The region has maintained autonomy from Moldova for three decades, and Russia has over a thousand troops stationed there since a brief war in 1992. Tensions increased after Russia's invasion of Ukraine in 2022, and Transnistria claims 220,000 Russian citizens. Moldova's pro-European government views the Congress as a propaganda event. Moldova's President Maya Sandu emphasized commitment to a peaceful resolution, while Ukrainian President Zelensky discussed regional developments with her, expressing concern over Russian efforts to destabilize the situation. The U.S. supports Moldova's sovereignty, closely monitoring Russia's actions in Transnistria. Russia's foreign ministry stated that defending Transnistria citizens' interests is a priority and will carefully review the request. The region's economy faces challenges under the new regulations, leading to an 18% decline in customs revenues and increased social and economic pressure. Russia plans to ban gasoline exports for six months starting March 1 to stabilize prices and address increasing demand for crude products. The ban, confirmed by Alexander Novak, the spokesperson for Russian President Putin and Deputy Prime Minister overseeing the energy sector, aims to counter surging domestic demand and assist refiners in the domestic market. Prime Minister Mikhail Mishustin approved the ban proposed by Novak, pending official decree. The move comes amid concerns over rising fuel prices ahead of the March presidential election and disruptions to Russian refineries from Ukrainian drone attacks. Since Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, many of its tankers have been sanctioned by the West, leading to a 27% decline in gasoline exports by mid-February, according to SP Global. Ulrika Richardson, the United Nations humanitarian coordinator in Haiti, highlighted escalating indiscriminate violence in the country, particularly in the capital and surrounding areas, where armed gangs are carrying out killings and acts of sexual violence. Richardson described the situation as inhuman, noting a 50% increase in sexual violence between 2022 and 2023, with 314,000 Haitians fleeing their homes to escape violence, leading to widespread humanitarian needs. About 5.5 million Haitians require assistance, including 4.4 million facing significant food insecurity. The UN launched a humanitarian appeal for $674 million, with half earmarked for food, despite lower funding compared to the previous year. Gangs have grown more powerful since the 2021 assassination of President Jovenel Moise, with over 8,400 people reported killed, injured, or kidnapped in 2023. Kenya was authorized by the UN Security Council to lead a multinational force to restore peace and security in Haiti, but its deployment is uncertain due to a court ruling in Kenya deeming it unconstitutional. The United States pledged support for the multinational force despite uncertainties surrounding its deployment, emphasizing the need to address gang violence in Haiti. The United States is urging the United Nations Security Council to take action to address the nearly year-long conflict in Sudan between the Sudanese Army and the Paramilitary Rapid Support Forces, RSF. The U.S. alleges war crimes committed by both parties, with the RSF and allied militias accused of crimes against humanity and ethnic cleansing. Approximately 25 million people, half of Sudan's population, are in need of aid, and around 8 million have been displaced. U.S. Ambassador to the UN Linda Thomas-Greenfield emphasized the urgency of the situation, calling for the Security Council to act to alleviate human suffering, 
hold perpetrators accountable, and bring an end to the conflict. Despite the conflict resulting in 10,000 to 15,000 deaths in Sudan's West Darfur region, the Security Council has issued only three press statements expressing concern since the conflict erupted in April 2023. The recent move by the Sudanese government to prohibit aid deliveries through Chad, a crucial supply route for the Darfur region, has been deemed unacceptable by Thomas Greenfield. The U.S. ambassador also expressed disappointment that the allegations in a UN sanctions monitors report received insufficient attention. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has announced £54 million, $68 million, in new funding over the next four years to protect Jewish communities against anti-Semitism. This announcement comes in response to a surge in anti-Semitic incidents in the UK following the outbreak of conflict between Israel and Hamas in October. The Community Security Trust, CST, reported that 2023 was the worst year for UK anti-Semitism since its records began in 1984. Sunak condemned the prejudice and racism, labeling it as hatred and an assault on the Jewish people. The government had previously allocated £18 million for 2024 to 25, bringing the total funding up to £70 million until 2028. The funding will be utilized to enhance security measures at various Jewish buildings across the country, including schools and synagogues, with provisions such as security guards, closed circuit TV, CCTV, and alarm systems. Brian Hook, the former top Iran official in the Trump administration, has suggested that President Joe Biden should make Iran bear a direct cost for attacks on U.S. forces by Iranian-backed proxies. Hook emphasized that Iran has historically operated in a gray zone, letting proxies bear the brunt of the conflict without facing direct consequences. He urged the Biden administration to announce that there would be no distinction between Iran and its proxies, holding the Iranian regime accountable for any actions carried out by its proxies. Hook argued that Iran has not faced sufficient direct costs, and until that happens, it will continue to operate with impunity. He highlighted recent attacks on U.S. troops by Iran-backed forces in Iraq and Syria, as well as attacks by Yemen's Iran-backed Houthis on commercial ships and warships. The Biden administration had previously launched retaliatory airstrikes in Iraq and Syria in response to attacks linked to Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps and its supported militias. A new poll from the Associated Press NRC Center for Public Affairs Research reveals a stark partisan divide among U.S. adults regarding support for military aid to Ukraine amid Russia's advances. Democrats are increasingly likely to say the U.S. is spending too little on Ukraine aid, while most Republicans believe it's too much. The poll shows that since November, support for increasing aid to Ukraine has grown among Democrats, with about 40% stating the U.S. is spending too little, up from 17%. In contrast, 55% of Republicans maintain the view that the U.S. is spending too much on Ukraine aid. The partisan split is reflected in Congress, where a $95 billion aid package has passed the Senate but faces reluctance in the Republican-held House. President Biden and Democratic leaders have urged Speaker Mike Johnson to take up the aid package, but Johnson and most Republicans argue that Congress must prioritize America's needs first. The poll also indicates that the Ukraine war has become a partisan issue, with Democrats more likely to emphasize the importance of preventing Russia from seizing more territory, negotiating a ceasefire, and providing aid to Ukraine. Republicans, especially those aligned with former President Donald Trump, exhibit a more isolationist stance and skepticism about America's involvement in global conflicts. Leaked Russian military files obtained by the Financial Times reveal that the Kremlin has considered various scenarios for the use of nuclear weapons. The 29 leaked files, dating from 2008 to 2014, pertain to tactical nuclear weapons rather than intercontinental range warheads. They outline specific conditions under which Russia might resort to nuclear warfare, such as the destruction of a certain percentage of its strategic ballistic missile submarines or nuclear powered attack submarines. These documents also include scenarios where China invades Russia, detailing when Moscow might deploy tactical nukes in a first strike decision to counter such an invasion. Despite the close diplomatic ties between Russia and China, these files suggest that Russia has considered the possibility of conflict with China. While China maintains a no first use nuclear policy, Russia's nuclear rhetoric, particularly since the invasion of Ukraine in 2022, has raised concerns. President Putin has warned of the possibility of nuclear war, prompting even China's President Xi Jinping to caution against such escalation. 
Both the Russian and Chinese governments have responded to inquiries about the leaked documents, with Putin's spokesperson challenging their authenticity and China emphasizing the enduring friendship between the two nations. The U.S. Supreme Court has agreed to review former President Donald Trump's claim of immunity from prosecution over his efforts to overturn the 2020 election results. This decision puts on hold a criminal case pursued by special counsel Jack Smith and will address whether a former president enjoys immunity from criminal prosecution for actions taken during his tenure in office. Trump, who is seeking the Republican nomination for the 2024 presidential election, is the first former president to face criminal prosecution. The case highlights the ongoing political divide, with Trump arguing for immunity while facing multiple criminal cases related to his actions surrounding the election. The Supreme Court's decision to review Trump's immunity claim adds another layer to the contentious legal battles surrounding the aftermath of the 2020 election and the Capitol attack. Former UN Ambassador Nikki Haley has called on Republican National Committee RNC, members to hold an on-the-record vote on a draft resolution that would limit the party's ability to use funds for legal fees, including those of former President Donald Trump. Haley expressed the need for transparency on how the RNC spends its money and whether it will be allocated to legal fees. RNC members are set to meet in March to select a new chair and vote on resolutions, including one that would prohibit the committee from paying any candidate's legal fees. The issue has raised concerns about potential conflicts within the party. The hacking group Lockbit, responsible for taking down Fulton County's websites in Georgia, is threatening to publish documents from the state's court system, including those related to the criminal case against Donald Trump, unless it receives a ransom payment. The group initially set a deadline for the payment, which has since been moved up. The demand comes after a law enforcement raid on Lockbit servers and the unsealing of an indictment accusing two Russian nationals of involvement in the group's operations. Lockbit has targeted various organizations in the past and operates on a service model, leasing out ransomware hacking tools to other hackers. The hack of Fulton County's computer systems has disrupted services, including the court website, and has raised concerns about potential leaks related to the Trump case. Lockbit's renewed ransom threat follows a series of hearings in the Trump case, with questions raised about the district attorney's conduct. A New York appeals court has denied Donald Trump's request to temporarily delay the payment of the state's $454 million verdict against him. The former president said he may be forced to sell properties to cover the judgment. The court rejected Trump's offer to post a $100 million bond backed by some of his major assets while he appeals, meaning he may soon have to post a bond of at least 110% of the judgment to keep it on hold during the appeal. The court granted a temporary delay to other aspects of the verdict, including a three-year ban on Trump seeking loans from New York chartered banks or serving as an officer or director of any state-based company. The ruling is valid until a full appellate panel hears Trump's request for a longer delay during his entire appeal. The $454 million verdict found Trump inflated the value of his assets to get better loan terms, resulting in an illegal profit. House and Senate leaders have reached a bipartisan deal to avert a partial government shutdown ahead of a Friday deadline. The deal involves the House voting on a temporary funding bill on Thursday, with the Senate to follow soon after. The legislation is expected to pass the House with Democratic support, but it could face procedural hurdles in the Senate. If passed, the deal would prevent a partial shutdown this Friday and set new funding deadlines for March 8 and March 22. The March 8 deadline coincides with President Biden's State of the Union address. Speaker Mike Johnson expressed optimism about the progress, although some GOP members have pushed back against the plan for continuing resolutions. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer emphasized the need for bipartisan cooperation to avoid a shutdown and urged House Republicans to set aside partisanship. Australia's Pacific Minister, Pat Conroy, has stated that there should be no role for China in policing the Pacific Islands. This comes after reports revealed that Chinese police are working in Kiribati. Conroy mentioned that Australia would train more local security forces to address security gaps and reiterated that there is no role for China in policing or broader security in the Pacific. The United States has also cautioned Pacific Islands against seeking assistance from Chinese security forces. The move comes amid increasing rivalry between China and the United States in the Pacific Islands. SpaceX's plans to provide communication services to Vietnam through its Starlink satellites have been put on hold, according to three sources familiar with the matter. Talks between SpaceX and Vietnamese authorities had been ongoing for months, 
but discussions were interrupted when it became clear that Vietnamese lawmakers would not relax foreign ownership limits for SpaceX. Consequently, Starlink's pilot services for Vietnam's Coast Guard, which used the satellites to guide drones in the South China Sea and the Gulf of Thailand, were suspended starting in November. It remains uncertain whether talks will resume. SpaceX had been seeking an exception to Vietnamese rules limiting foreign ownership in telecommunication companies. But a revision of the country's telecommunications law approved by parliament in November did not soften the limits. Additionally, a draft decree released in February added requirements for satellite service providers, including SpaceX, regarding local presence and data traffic controls. The deployment of Starlink has raised concerns, with an op-ed in a Chinese military publication describing it as a serious threat to the security of space assets of various countries. Malaysia's Court of Appeal has reinstated former Prime Minister Muhyiddin Yassin's for abuse of power charges, overturning a previous ruling by the High Court that acquitted him. Muhyiddin had faced four counts of abuse of power and three counts of money laundering, becoming the second ex-Malaysian premier to be indicted after Najib Razak. Prosecutors alleged that three companies and an individual sent 232.5 million ringgit, $48.8 million, to Muhyiddin's party's bank account while he was prime minister. Muhyiddin, who leads the Malay majority opposition bloc Perikatan Nasional, has denied any wrongdoing. A retired Chinese official, He Feilai, who purchased 13 houses using bribe money, has become a widely discussed topic on China's internet after details of his case were made public by the Central Commission for Discipline Inspection. He Fei Lai, a former forestry official in Shangxi province, bought the properties using the names of family members after stepping down in 2017. He was sentenced to 12 years in prison in 2022 for taking bribes worth around 40 million yuan, $5.6 million. The case sheds light on the millions of local officials caught up in President Xi Jinping's anti-corruption campaign.